Welcome, and thanks for listening to Intrinsic Investigations. My name is Mr. Olivo, and I created this podcast because I've been fortunate enough over the last decade to see unique and thought-provoking projects happen in my classroom, and we wanted a place to showcase them. The true heart of this podcast lies not in the content discovered, but in exploring the personal stories of these young researchers as they journey through uncharted and unfamiliar intellectual terrain. By sharing their stories, we hope to normalize the challenges and frustrations that come with independent research and also share those moments where students transcend the normal grind of the school day to discover concepts that range from the global to deeply personal. We will begin with a brief introduction to the student of focus, why they pick their topic, and discuss their growth over the course of the last year. It should be mentioned that the opinions expressed in this podcast in no way reflect the opinions of our school district, Bergen County Technical Schools and Special Services, or our school itself, Bergen County Technical High School Teterboro, or the College Board. The work detailed in this podcast was most likely completed in AP Capstone, but this podcast is in no way affiliated with the College Board. Our guest today is Amelie, who did a content analysis of dialogue in the anorexic community on Tumblr. I'm joined here by Amelie. Amelie, I already introduced your work by title, but do you want to tell the audience what your work this year was about? Yeah, sure. So um, basically, my work was looking at the communications on um, eating disorder communities on Tumblr. Specifically, I was focusing on the anorexia community um, with the specific hashtags of not pro-anorexia. So it's things that are not encouraging people to have anorexia directly. So if a user were to fat shame someone else or to encourage them to eat less, anything like that, that's all pro anna. So everything that isn't that. So everything that isn't that. So what would be, uh, can you give an example from what you studied of a statement that fit the criteria of what you were examining? Yeah, so um, one example of not being pro Anna would be um, there were several different users that expressed um, kind of a similar sentiment, but basically the idea that um, the user themselves could not see themselves as being beautiful, being pretty, without being like incredibly skinny, without restricting calories, but they didn't necessarily apply that same view to others. So they said like specifically like almost word for word like, oh, it's not other people that can't be pretty if they're not skinny. It's just me. So something like that would be considered not pro Anna. That's a highly self-critical statement. Yeah, there's a lot of self-deprecation involved. Um, part of one of my tags, um, frustration, um, a lot of it came from like that kind of self-deprecating um, sort of obsessive amount of control where the user, um, they felt as if they wouldn't be good enough if they didn't kind of succeed at anorexia, if they didn't restrict enough calories, if they weren't kind of the best at it, which is um, kind of similar to what Olivia Napton found in her work. She did a content analysis on pro-anorexia websites, and she basically found like the same thing, where anorexia is considered a skill, and if you're not good, in it, if you're not good at it, then you're not good enough. And that's one thing that really stuck out to me as you were evolving in your understanding of the topic was the idea of anorexia as a skill because obviously anorexia and bulimia are probably the two most talked about eating disorders in the United States and you can probably speak more to the statistics on that but the anorexia as a skill idea never popped into my head until seeing you deliver your information over the course of the year so we're already uh, actually kind of getting into the weeds of your work, but do you want to tell the audience a little bit about you and why you chose this topic? Yeah, so um, me specifically, I don't really have a specific reason like for choosing this topic. I did my sample content analysis on it last year at the end of AP Seminar. Um, so I kind of decided to stick with that because I found it really interesting. Um, I first came up with it because... Um, I was on Pinterest and <laughs> there's a lot of um, that kind of similar sentiment on there and I saw a screen cap from Tumblr. On Pinterest? Yeah, on Pinterest. Because um, it's like, you know the whole like coquette, like, they, so it's like- No, a, no this, is, this is where I learned from you. So 
educate me. Okay, yeah. So um, coquette is essentially this aesthetic that's like really popular on Pinterest, or it was at the time. And it's basically centered around the idea of being like hyper feminine, like um, a lot of times like acting kind of like a young girl, like um, there's a lot of emphasis on being pink and like girly and stuffed animals and things like that. So it kind of makes sense why anorexia would be kind of um, linked with that. And so as I was like scrolling along on my Pinterest feed, I find a screen cap from Tumblr and it was essentially saying like something similar, like, oh, like, um, it's only me that can't be pretty unless I'm skinny. And I was like, whoa, that's, um, that's definitely something. So um, this is around the time that we had to decide for our topics um, in SEM. And I was like, okay, like this seems like something interesting that I would want to research. Like, why would someone make that kind of statement about themselves? So I ended up picking that to do my work on. And it was just that simple piece of content that you got exposed to, not, not that you were looking for it. It just happened to be in a Pinterest feed. Yeah, pretty much. Um, It's definitely um, to be discussed that like this kind of content could come across like to someone who wasn't looking for it, you know? Um, And the fact that it was linked so like heavily with this aesthetic that like, let's just say I was like, oh, looking at like coquette inspired things or whatever, that it appeared alongside like whatever, you know, fashion I was looking at, you know? Okay, so this is a, research class and obviously you're you're out there in the world making observations last year so this started this this interest this curiosity started last year when you ha- when it came down to doing original research on it how did you organize yourself to systematically analyze something like this and what were the what were some key steps that you took to make sense of I'm sure there's a ton of content out there that fits in the description of what you're describing, uh, for lack of a better word, and just the description of what you're describing. Oh, got to choose better words here. But wh- what what did you do to get ready to do the analysis? What were some sources that you went to, and how did you break this down? Yeah. So um, one of my a couple of my key sources, um, the one by Olivia Napton, I mentioned earlier. Um, was really important in kind of getting some context as to what exactly it was that I was going to kind of be finding in these um, communities. Um, The one by Shi Sharma, um, the one with epitome, the scale that I used to measure empathy was incredibly important since I was really struggling with how to um, operationalize empathy and how to actually like measure it since it's kind of an abstract concept. So- um, Oh, it definitely is. Yeah, yeah. So um, finding that was really key. Um, Other than that, I was kind of just, you know, making it up as I went along for lack of (laughs) um, better, like, descriptors. Obviously, like, it was, you know, as professional as, you know, a high school student could make it. But um, it really was just kind of, like, looking at sources, kind of trying to see, like, what they were doing and trying to just follow that example. Like, you know, getting the top post under a specific hashtag. Um, that's kind of like what most people do. So I just, you know, took like 10 different, um, variations of the hashtag, not pro for me, not for thee, which is like kind of the tag that I found basically, um, describes what I was looking for. And so, um, I just took like five different posts, the top posts under each of those tags. And then I did my analysis on that. So pro for me, not for thee. Yeah which I guess speaks to what you brought up several minutes ago about this idea of other people cannot be anorexic and that's not a problem, but the the people who are suffering from this just holding themselves to that standard is if, if I'm interpreting that hashtag correctly, because I never heard that hashtag before. Yeah, um, it definitely has a little ring to it. Pro for me, not for the... I mean, it rhymes, rhyme. you know, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's basically what it's saying, like, you know, I'm pro anorexia for myself. I'm going to continue to encourage myself to eat less, consume fewer calories, you know, sometimes even purging, things like that. Um, but they're not going to post like this kind of um, pro anorexia content. They're not going to, you know, specifically target someone else and, um, you know, tell them, oh, hey, like you should eat less. You're not, you're so ugly. You know, they're not going to say that kind of thing. 
Would they express empathy? Because I know you mentioned the epitome scale. So the people who are pro for me, not for thee, would they go out of... Was there any examples that you saw of these people expressing empathy for people who were suffering with anorexia? Or it was hard for you to find that? Um, what's kind of interesting with that is that I ended up finding that there was more... There were more examples of like empathy for like the user themselves that um, they would post something and like, you know, they would express their own emotions and would explain like why they were feeling that way and they would just kind of look for validation themselves. Um, any posts that I did find that were like empathetic towards others had very few notes, which is like interactions. It's like the culmination of like likes, shares, reblogs, all of that. Um, it had very few notes, um, not a lot of interaction with it. So um, it wasn't really popular within the community. Um, the posts with the top notes were um, kind of posts that had like more general frustration, like kind of venting to them that a lot of people could relate to, which I kind of thought of as like maybe another research project would be good on that. Like, um, because a lot more people seem to relate to the content, so they ended up like, you know, empathizing with the user more. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. So when you say general frustrations, what, what did that look like in that in that post that led to those notes and those interactions? What what would an example be? Um, so a lot of users talked about um, binging, which is kind of like eating excessively. Um, they talked about their struggles with, like, stopping themselves from binging even after they, like, fasted or restricted their calories for a prolonged amount of time. And they would just share, like, oh, hey, like, I'm feeling so frustrated right now because I can't stop myself from binging. And I thought I made so much progress, but I feel like I just reset everything that I did after I just pigged out on food or whatever. And now, like... I don't even know why I continue doing this, like that kind of thing. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest discovery that you came across? I know you you, meant, you just mentioned, you know, going down that pathway of lack of interaction, uh, possibly as a future direction. But with this particular study, what do you think was the biggest thing you discovered in the context of, you know, you mentioned Olivia Nampton's work. Uh, like, how does your work what does your work reveal and how does it fit in with what came before it, you think? So um, I kind of talked about empathy before, but it really is a big thing in the kind of eating disorder research community since it's not exactly agreed upon like what exactly like the effect of um, eating disorders is on the capability to feel empathy. So for example, in my presentation, I mentioned the work by Gagaro where they kind of found that um, empathy was reduced for other people and was increased for um, the person themselves, which is kind of reflected in my own work. But there were several other sources that I was finding while I was, you know, doing my initial research where they found, like, several other combinations where it could be like, oh, it increases empathy overall, or it decreases empathy for the person themselves, but increases it for others. So I think my research just kind of um, adds into that conversation. Um, it's not a definitive answer, but it's definitely um, there in order to kind of find the conclusive, like, you know, findings. So this idea of empathy for oneself, is that, because by definition, empathy is, you know, being able to, to understand the thoughts and the feelings of someone else. So is empathy for oneself almost them practicing that ability to understand one's thoughts and feelings? I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding uh, that term correctly. Yeah, so empathy for the self would, it's basically, it's like the same thing as like empathizing with others where it would be like, okay, you're expressing your emotions and whereas like for other people to be like, oh, you're like identifying their emotions. Um, Cause a lot of people struggle with that, like identifying their own emotions and you know really working through things like that so it would be identifying your own emotions specifying what exactly it is that you're feeling and then um it just kind of be like okay backtracking and asking why you feel that way so for example one post that i found 
that was empathetic like of the user like for themselves it was them explaining the frustration because they'd shared that um they had anorexia with their roommate and the roommate went on to um kind of do some kind of bad things you know um the user like um said basically oh i'm so frustrated can we can we elaborate on what these bad things are oh (laughs) sorry so um the roommate if i'm if i'm remembering correctly the roommate um proceeded to go on and like lose a bunch of weight to reach the user's goal weight um and then to the user's like partner was like oh i'm this person's goal weight now like something like that they it was kind of bad because um we're gonna put this in the low empathy category yeah no that was (laughs) that was low empathy on the roommate's part but basically the user was like oh yeah i'm so frustrated with this person like this is why i don't share you know about my eating disorder with other people um and then they kind of said like oh i'm feeling this way because like when I was growing up, I never really had any anyone to, like, share my own, like, you know, thoughts with. And now that I, f- like, trust someone, they, like, go and do this. Like, so they're sharing, like, the roots of, like, possibly why they're feeling like this. And then they go on to be like, okay, so um, from now on, like, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to trust someone like that again. So they do, like, an interpretation, kind of, of their feelings. And then they go on to, like future like you know um effects of that event oh they detailed they detailed actually what happened after the event or are they projecting some hypothetical future in that case yeah it was like a hypothetical like okay okay. like even if i like i'm never telling anyone about my eating disorder again and that's kind of why they go on to online communities um which i kind of said in my presentation where it's like there's a sense of like isolation from you know the offline world because of the eating disorder so because they feel like they can't share with anyone in real life since no one in real life can really relate they go on to these like eating disorder communities where they like you know have other people that have the same eating disorder are feeling the same way they can express how they're feeling about it but ultimately it kind of does more harm than good in most cases is what i kind of found because it does create that echo chamber of like, okay, so I see someone else that's eating less than I am, that's, you know, um, purging more often than I am. I have to one up my game, like, and and I see the skill. Yeah, I have to one up my game, and then they end up getting worse. So this is a topic that you said you were you first became interested last May. Uh, so it is May right now. So this is a full year and i don't know if in the summer of last year like just things were out there on the internet that you kind of were picking up where you're like oh that that might be related to what i'm going to be looking at next year but you've spent almost about a year either thinking about this topic or a good five months really systematically analyzing it through a content analysis what would you say is the the most beneficial thing for you as a person, not necessarily a student in doing this project? What what was the payoff for you now in the present? Um, You can get into future payoffs as well. If you felt like this made you a better presenter or, but I'm I'm trying to think what, what do you know right now that is useful in, in doing this project? I mean, um, eating disorders is something that like, really impacts young women um i said this before but like one in every hundred women in the united states will have an eating disorder in their lifetime um and like 95 percent of everybody with anorexia is between the ages of 10 and 25 which is insane when you think about it so it's really like impactful on you know this age group um this demographic and kind of like you were saying before sometimes I hear like people in conversation like saying things and I'm like oh that would be like this tag or I would code this as this um and it kind of changes the way you think you know because once you like see really like this kind of toxic um kind of way of thinking you learn to like kind of spot it in other people or even in like 
our Western diet culture, this is something that Olivia Napton also addresses, where it's like, these eating disorder communities are really just like, kind of a more extreme extension of already ingrained concepts in our Western diet culture, where it's like, oh, like magazines, like even like all supermodels and, you know, everything related to that. It's all kind of pushing people to have, even if it's not an eating disorder, having an unhealthy relationship with eating. Some kind of disordered eating. Maybe not an eating disorder, but some kind of disordered eating. So um, it was kind of interesting for me to learn, like, all about that. Um, It kind of helped me reevaluate the way I think um, about, like, eating and food in general. And um, I feel like it's just really helpful information to know. It's so interesting that you bring this up because earlier today I had come across an article on The Atlantic about intermittent fasting. And it was the title is The, the Fad Diet to End All Fad Diets. And as I was reading the article, just in terms of the, the information from your work changing how I perceive it, there were so many elements of intermittent fasting as a skill that were embedded in the article. Like this idea that the more you can, it's almost something, it's something to be proud of. Like the longer you can fast and the less calories you can take in on your fasting days, it's like, yeah, you did it. And the article also gets into the science of whether or not intermittent fasting is beneficial is very mixed to put it generously. Uh, but that skill component is very much there. Uh, I feel like in that facet of, of American eating. Yeah, no, it's very mainstream. Um, this idea of like, you know, the less you eat, like, um, the more you can restrain yourself, the more self-control you can have, um, the better. Um, and it's really, really unhealthy. Um, even aside from like all these like fad diets and whatever, I know Brian did his work on that. Yes. Um, yeah. Even that aside podcast from, is coming later. Yeah. yeah. Later episode. Yeah. Soon. Later episode. But um, you know, even like aside from all those fad diets, even if you're not following a diet, um, just like those small choices, like, you know, a lot of people don't eat breakfast, um, things like that. I eat breakfast every day, listeners. I just want to be very clear about that. Yeah, I don't, um, just because, you know, I really do not have time for that as a BT student. But on Mother's Day, she had an enormous breakfast. Yes, I this did. This was revealed before the podcast. Yes, a very large Dominican breakfast. There it was go. really good. And I'm, I'm jealous, and I would have liked that breakfast as well. Yeah. But, um, so just things like that, like these intentional choices just to, you know, oh, like I can eat later, like, oh, I don't have to eat now, it's fine. Like, just that kind of idea of, um, you know, just restraining yourself for longer periods of time is very, very prevalent. All right, great. So comparing this class to, and you know, we'll wrap up on this question. That was, that was a great uh, interview. But comparing uh, this class to, you know, a typical class that you had at the high school level and the apprehensions that you had coming in and now that it's behind you, what would you say, uh, wh- how would you say this compares to other classes that you've taken in your junior year? in terms of your approach, in terms of the outcomes, uh, just, you know, general summary of what's different about this type of course versus other courses. It really is different in almost every single way possible. Um, Just in, like, the way it's structured, you know, like, every single assignment we do is, like, focused so that we can, like, either write more of our paper or do more of our project or something or so that we can like improve on a skill that we're going to need in order to like do our research and stuff um there's like really no busy work or anything like everything has a purpose pretty much Um, i mean i try yeah i try yeah uh you did a good job of that i appreciate it yeah um but like not just that but just kind of the skills you need in order to like do well in this course um or even like grow because you know for me like succeeding is kind of like improving and growing but I know that's not the same for everyone but um unfortunately yeah um but you know like you do definitely need you know obviously being able to write well um being able to present and things like that but I really would encourage like even if you're not good at reading even if you're not good at writing like 
take this course because it really does like shift the way you think about work and like schoolwork in general. Um, you know, I used to be a huge procrastinator. I still kind of am, but um, I kind of worked on that throughout the year. And so um, this class is like a big reason why, because you really can't like procrastinate like, like you would in another class and still do well. So there's definitely that. Well, there's plenty of adult procrastinators in the world out there. So don't worry. You're working on it now and you're growing and it'll help you hopefully find the purpose in the things that you do so that you find those things meaningful. And then we don't procrastinate the things that we like to do. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Amelie, and best of luck in your future endeavors because I don't think I'm going to be your teacher next year. But hey, we never know. Yeah. All right. It's been a fun year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any final words for the people out there? Uh, tremendous light and um, bleak, bleak walls, bright minds. You heard it here first.